Everybody. Today, you're going to learn your last method of advanced techniques of integration, and it is partial fraction decomposition. So, um, like I said, this is the last one that you're responsible for for the AP exam. And what this is going to do is help you evaluate integrals with rational expressions. Rational, remember, means fractional. Before I show you a whole problem, let's kind of go backwards here so you can see where this even comes from. Let's start with these two fractions here, and let's say I want to add them. Now, obviously, to add these, I'm going to need common denominators. And to get a common denominator, I would have to multiply this one by x minus 1 over x minus 1, and this one by x plus 2 over x plus 2. Now, what that would leave me with, if I just dis uh, distribute in the numerator here, I'd have 3x plus 6 plus 5x minus 5, all over your new common denominator. And then that would leave you with 8x plus 1 all over the common denominator. So this is equivalent to this. So here I have just one numerator. It's linear, and it came from these two constants in the numerator. All right, so now let's say that I gave you this, which is what we just ended up with. And I asked you what two fractions were added to give us this. Now, we already know the two fractions. They're right here. But let's say you didn't know what we started with. What you would have to do is figure out what two constants, these two right here, we already know what they are. But if we didn't know what they were, let's call them A and B. We'd have to know what two constants that we, uh, we started with in order to end up here. So I'm going to take the ending result, and I'm going to say that my numerator is the same thing as two constants added together, one constant over the first linear factor in the denominator, and the second one over the second linear factor. Now, like I said, we already know that it's going to be 3 and 5 over each linear factor, but let's go backwards and try and figure out what a and b are, pretending we don't know what they are. Okay, how are we going to solve for a and b here? Now, there's a technique that you can do here. You can clear out the denominators by multiplying each side, this side and this side, by this common denominator. So I did that in red here. I multiplied by x minus 1 plus times x plus 2 on each side of the equation. Now, on the left-hand side, it completely cancels out. I just have 8x plus 1. On the right-hand side, I distributed to the first fraction and the second fraction, giving me this and this. And on the first fraction, the x minus 1s cancel. On the second fraction, the x plus 2 cancels. So I'm left with this here. Now, if I distribute the a and the b, I'm left with this right here. And let's keep solving here. Let's group our terms into variables and constants here. So I'm going to have 8x plus 1 equals ax plus bx plus 2 minus b. And then I have 8x plus 1. Let's factor an x out. So here's my variable terms. And I can't really factor anything out of these constants here. It's just 2 minus b. I had to pause the video because I realized I forgot this a here, which is in red right now. So go back and put the a back in whenever I distributed the a. I had a 2, not a 2a there. Anyway, so I'm going to be left with this statement right here. And if I want to solve, what I can do is set the variable terms equal to each other and the constant terms equal to each other. If 8x plus 1 is equal to a plus bx plus 2a minus b, remember this whole term right here is a constant, there's no variable. That means that 8 must be equal to a plus b because they're both the coefficient of the x variable term and 1 is equal to 2a minus b. 
Now what I have here is a little baby system, so let's solve it. A plus B equals 8, 2A minus B equals 1, and let's add these two together. A plus 2A is 3A, that cancels, and I have A equals 3. And if A plus B equals 8 and A is 3, then B must be 5. So that should look familiar because check it out, we had 3 and 5 to begin with. So that means I can rewrite my original as 3 over x minus 1 plus 5 over x plus 2. And that is what 8x plus 1 all over x minus 1 times x plus 2 is equal to. And just keep in mind that up top here, I rewrote my original as a over x minus 1 plus b over x plus 2 right here. So I just filled in my a and my b. And that's how I'm able to say that these two are equal. Now this is fine. Like solving a system works. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, there's a way easier method to do it. And you're probably wondering why I showed you systems to begin with if you're not going to be doing it. It's just good to see more than one way. In college, your professors might like this way. This is uh, the way I learned. I didn't learn about this method until this past summer. Uh, it's called the Heaviside method. There was a mathematician whose last name was Heaviside. He came up with this. So he named it after himself. Uh, this is the way you're actually going to want to do it on the AP exam. Uh, do not use systems on the exam. It takes up a little bit too much time, and remember, every second counts here. The way that Heaviside works is you're going to strategically choose convenient values of x to solve for a and b, and it's much, much quicker. So this is what I start with. I'm going to pick up, oh my god, I'm going to pick up right here. The spot that I'm picking up on is right here, this line right there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to notice that this factor would equal 0 if x was equal to negative 2. And this factor would equal 0 if x was equal to 1. So let's rewrite this statement, which is true for all x's, and evaluate it when x is equal to negative 2 and then when x is equal to 1. So if x is equal to negative 2, I'm going to plug negative 2 in here. And if I plug negative 2 in here, this whole thing is 0. And I have b times negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. Uh, a times negative 2 plus 1 is going to give me negative 16 plus 1, negative 15 equals negative 3b. So b is equal to 5. And then if x is equal to 1, I'm going to have 8 times 1 plus 1 equals, plug 1 into here, I have a times 3. And then plug 1 into here, that zeroes out. That's the nice thing about this. It makes one term 0 out, and you can solve for each one very, very quickly. And you get the same thing. All right, so why on earth would I even want to do this? And the answer to that is to solve an integral that looks like this. It's a rational integral. And we already wrote the partial fraction decomposition of this. We found that this was equal to 3 over x minus 1 plus 5 over x plus 2 with the dx. Using properties of integrals, I'm going to pull the constant out, and I'm going to rewrite the integral of these two, I'm going to split it up, give each its own integral, just so you can see the antiderivative really easily. Antiderivative of this involves ln, as does this one. The constant's just along for the ride, so 3 times natural log of x minus 1 plus 5 times natural log of x plus 2 plus c, and you're done. So these are pretty much always going to involve natural log because you're always going to be writing it as a fraction hence the name partial fractions. So get used to using LNs here, that's completely normal. Um, keep in mind, no, uh, just some terms here, this is the partial fraction decomposition, and here we are integrating term by term. All right, cool, let's do another one. For the next example, you're gonna notice that the degree here is two, and before you start freaking out thinking that this isn't gonna work, notice that if you were to foil down here, your degree would be three. As long as the degree on the bottom is bigger than the degree on top, the method we're using is gonna work out fine. Now notice here we have three linear factors, so I'm gonna to need to know what three fractions I added together and what three constants, one for each fraction, were used in order to end up with this common denominator expression. 
So basically every single linear factor gets its own denominator, always. And above each linear factor, for now, you're going to put the constant C, or sorry, put the constant A, B, C, D, whatever, that you're trying to find. So um, let's multiply each side by the common denominator. So I multiply each side by that. Notice what cancels here. I squeeze this in over here. This whole thing basically cancels out. You're left with just x squared plus 2. And then when I multiply this by the a, x minus 1 cancels, and I'm left with 2x minus 8 and x plus 2. When I multiply it by the middle fraction, then I have b, x minus 1, and x plus 2 remain there. And then multiply by c, and there we go. The x minus 1 and 2x minus 8 are there. So I'm going to have to figure out what three x values I'm going to strategically choose in order to cancel out one of the terms each time. And each of these is going to give me one of the constants that I want. Okay, let's see. If I used 1, this would be 0. If I used 4, this one would be 0. And if I used negative 2, then this one would be 0. So let's do the net, uh, x equals 1 first. So I'm going to plug 1 in on the left. 1 squared plus 2 is 3. This one does not zero out. I have a times 2 times 1 minus 8 is negative 6. And then uh, 1 plus 2 is 3. So I have 3 equals negative 18a. a is equal to negative 1 sixth. All right, now use 4. 4 squared plus 2 is 18. And then I'm going to plug 4 in here. This zeroes out. I'm going to plug 4 in here. This does not zero out. 4 minus 1 is 3. 4 plus 2 is 6. So I have 18 equals 18b. B is 1. That one's nice. And then choose negative 2. Negative 2 squared plus 2 is 6. Plug negative 2 in here. Zeroes out. Plug negative 2 in here. Zeroes out. And I have 3, sorry, c times negative 3 times negative 12. So 6 equals 36c, and divide by 36, c is 1 sixth. Now that I have a, b, and c, what I can do is plug them into this up here. So there's my a, b, and c. I take my original, which was the integral of this, and I'm going to say it's the same thing as the integral of this, with a, b, and c plugged in. So above x minus 1 was a, which is negative 1 sixth. Above 2x minus a was 8, was b, which is 1, right here. And above x plus 2 was c, which I found out was 1 sixth, which goes here. So again, I'm going to use properties of integrals to make this look a little bit nicer. I'm going to pull out my constants. I'm going to do the integral term, do the antiderivative term by term. And that involves ln, again, because it's 1 over something to the first power. Remember, all of these are to the first power. And you're used to it just being like x, not necessarily x and something else. But it works with x plus or minus something. And you know what? I just realized I forgot a 1 half here. Because if I were to do the derivative of this, it'd be 1 over 2x minus 8 times 2. And I don't want a 2 there because there wasn't a 2 to begin with. So I'm going to put a 1 half there to undo that. All right, so I'm going to give you two problems to try on your own. And I'm going to put the answers right after it so that you can check your work right away. So your two examples that I want you to do are right here. The first one is pretty basic. The second one you're going to have to do three instead of just two factors. Um, notice here, it's not in factored form, so just factor them quick. This one is going to be written as two factors, and there's going to be an A and a B, and you'll have to solve for A and B. This one is going to be three factors, and you're going to have to figure out what A, B, and C are. It's the two to the third degree, so that's how you know there's three factors. All right, so I'm going to pause the video right now, try them both, don't just copy my work. It's not going to help you. For the first one, again, you should have tried this on your own first. Here's the work. Pause it because I'm going to move and show you the second work before I run out of time here. And here's the second one. I'm slowly scrolling down. Just pause it as needed to check your work. And the final answer is in purple.